It's okay. Just do it slowly. Did the pilots understand the flight systems well enough? Only the voice recorder can provide answers. Captain Kevin Stables is preparing to pilot Emory Worldwide Flight 17. His first officer is George Land. They're hauling freight across the country aboard a 30-year-old DC-8 cargo plane. Uh, hi there. Is that the load plan? Just before they're finished up and loading the last uh, couple of containers, they would give us a list of all the freight containers and how much it weighed and what position on the airplane it was. There you go, boss. Then we'd take that information and we would calculate the weight and balance on the airplane and make sure that it was all correct. Airspeed's alive. Alive here. 80 knots. 80 knots. Elevator checks. Just another routine takeoff. V1. Rotate. But as the nose wheel leaves the ground, the DC-8 pitches upward much more steeply than it should. Watch the tail. They recognize that they have an issue during the course of the airplane actually starting to rotate as it lifts off the runway. V2, positive rate. The sudden takeoff is quickly followed by an uncommanded left bank. I got it. You got it? Yeah. This is anything but routine. We're going back. What the hell? The center of gravity is way out of limits. They need to return to the airport as quickly as possible. Emory 17 emergency. Emory 17, say again? When a pilot declares an emergency, that really cues an air traffic controller to know that this isn't just an abnormal situation. This is a critical situation. The ground proximity warning begins to sound. We're sinking, we're going down, guys. All right, all right. Okay, we're going back up. The DC-8 starts climbing again. Roll out, roll out. But the pilots are still struggling for control. Uh, Emory 17, extreme balance problem. Emory 17, roger. The airplane started to go into these big perturbations, dive and then climb, dive and then climb. They pushed their control columns all the way forward in a desperate effort to level the plane. Power. More? Yeah. Captain Stables and his crew have managed to get their crippled plane to within sight of the runway. It was working very well. He made it almost all the way around to the backside of the airport. They knew if they could get back to the airport, there was going to be crash fire rescue that would have been able then to help them. They've now got less than a mile to go. They're still trying to look ahead to figure out what needs to be done next. But they know that sooner or later, they got to get on the ground. Emory Flight 17 has crashed into a car scrapyard one mile east of Sacramento's Mather Airport. All three crew members are dead. The job of figuring out why this happened now falls to the National Transportation Safety Board. Hey. This place is a mess. Yeah. With so much fire damage and thousands of car parts on site, just finding the airplane wreckage is going to be a huge challenge. The NTSB's John Goya helps lead the effort. Put this in the plane bin for me, please. Mechanical pieces, especially after they're burned, it's very difficult to tell a piece from an automobile to from a piece from an airplane. So I looked at the scene and said, wow, we got a real tiger by the tail here. Investigators will have to sift through a debris field about 450 feet wide and a quarter of a mile long. Now that looks like uh, wiring from a car. The T-1 
team soon makes a crucial find. The most important items of evidence in any air crash investigation. Well done, guys. We did find both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder, which actually sped up that part of the investigation because we could send those two boxes back on the airplane that we had flown in on. The NTSB sends the critical recording devices to Washington, where lab technicians can begin the job of processing the data. At the same time, investigators hunt down as much other evidence as they can. They learn that Flight 17 was carrying nothing unusual, mostly clothing. But they wonder, did the positioning of the freight cause a dangerous imbalance? If you look at an airplane, there is a point in the middle of the airplane that is the center, and everything flows around it. So if you have too much weight in the back, right, the center of gravity is going to shift to the rear, and the airplane is going to fly differently. All right, this looks a little lighter than usual, but it's well within the center of gravity limits. Load distribution was not the culprit. Something else must have caused the crash. The team is soon chasing a new lead. Past complaints to the FAA from Emory pilots. It seems some pilots were worried about how the company was securing its cargo. They reported seeing frayed straps and netting. You know, if Emory was lax with their loading practices, the load could have shifted. What if the cargo wasn't properly secured? They examined cargo fasteners recovered from the wreckage. If there was a load shift, the metal clamps, known as bear claws, should display distinct damage. All right, let's take a look at these things. When we're looking at these bear claws, we're looking for physical evidence. That is, if the pallet was clamped in place and the energy from the impact pushed it, it would typically break it or leave a witness mark or impact mark. They find no such evidence. All of these restraints look just fine. The thing is, if there wasn't a problem in the cargo hold, why were the pilots reporting a problem with their center of gravity? Is that the CVR? Oh, finally. All right, let's do this. They hope the cockpit voice recorder from Emory Flight 17 will provide some answers. Transasia Flight 222 has crashed into the village of Shishi, less than a mile from the Taiwanese airport where it was scheduled to land. Taiwanese rescuers race to the crash site of Transasia Flight 222. They soon discover that of the 58 people who were on board, 48 are dead. At investigation headquarters in Taipei, the team begins sorting evidence while they wait to see what the black box data will reveal about the Transasia crash. What have you found? But already, media reports are filled with speculation. People are saying that the typhoon caused the crash. Well, let's see what effect the typhoon had. They need to know how the distant typhoon was affecting airport weather conditions at the moment of the crash. They take a closer look at the weather data. Uh, wind speed 11 knots, gusting to 21 knots, but within the operational limits of the aircraft. They calculate that winds may have been strong enough to push the commuter plane off course, but not enough to cause a catastrophic upset. What about the visibility? I've got images from the airport at that time. Visibility will be a very key issue for us to understand whether the flight crew can visually locate the runway or not. They know that Transasia 222 crashed at 7.06 p.m. The airport images from just before that time reveal some stunning evidence. It's starting to be more than just rain. That's, that's a serious storm. After 7 o'clock start to, to getting stronger, we got heavy rain shower and the, the visibility decrease very quickly just after uh, 7 o'clock. 
pilots are required to have a minimum range of clear visibility in order to land. Investigators estimate that at the time of the crash, visibility was so limited, the TransAsia crew would not have been able to see the runway until they were practically on top of it. Visibility can't be more than a couple hundred meters. How could they have been allowed to land? TransAsia Flight 222 has crashed into the village of Shishi less than a mile from the Taiwanese airport where it was scheduled to land. The team begins sorting evidence while they wait to see what the black box data will reveal about the TransAsia crash. At a nearby hangar, investigators sift through the remains of TransAsia Flight 222. They're looking for any sign of a mechanical fault, anything that could explain why the aircraft veered off course and crashed short of the runway. So we check all the control service and the, the control linkage. And we check the power plant. They find nothing that points to a control service having failed in flight. Both of the turboprop engines appear to be mechanically sound. And their electronic circuitry all looks normal. But we find there, there's no evidence to show that there is a existing mechanical problem or engine problem. The careful analysis leaves no doubt. Flight 222 was not brought down by a mechanical or systems failure. Investigators are going to need another theory. Air crash investigators in Dallas are trying to figure out why Delta Airlines Flight 1141 crashed on takeoff. There was a lot of traffic at Dallas-Fort Worth. We could be looking at a wingtip vortex. Wingtip vortices are spirals of air that trail off the tips of an airplane's wings. The heavier the plane, the bigger the vortex. These tornado-like winds can sometimes be strong enough to pose an invisible hazard to other planes. Was Flight 1141 cleared for takeoff too soon, bringing it too close to the plane ahead? Air traffic records show that the plane that took off just before Flight 1141 was Delta Airlines Flight 1486, another Boeing 727. They get takeoff clearance at 8.59.17. In this case, we did calculate the probable location of the wingtip vortices for the airplanes that were nearest to the accident airplane. By then, the other Delta plane was off the ground and already 7,000 feet ahead of them. Investigators know that the minimum Federal Aviation Authority requirement for separation between flights is 6,000 feet. We found that even assuming the vortices stayed as strong as they could possibly stay and that they moved in a, in a manner that put them as close as possible to the accident airplane, that they would still be a significant distance away from the accident aircraft. The failed takeoff of Delta 1141 is still a mystery. Crash site wreckage of Delta Airlines Flight 1141 suggests the 727 may not have been properly configured for takeoff. Okay, you ready? But is there anything on the recording that can back up that theory? I forgot to get my paycheck. Did you get yours? Yeah, I got mine. They should be focused on the flight, not talking about paychecks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are Good. number four for departure. Attendance. Prepare the cabin, please. We are ready. Thank you. So far, they've heard nothing about the flap configuration. But what they hear next is another surprise. We might as well start. Number three, start valve over. 141 taxi to position runway 18 left and hold. Okay, 1141 position and hold. Hold up a minute, stop. Here's where the controller bumps them into first position 
and they've just restarted the engine. So they did get a little rush there, and, and it was attributed to having the flight attendant in the cockpit and, and the casual conversations that were going on. And they hit all the items on the checklist. You could go right down the checklist, and they, they got them all. Once again, the no flaps theory is in question. But investigators may have a way to resolve the flap issue once and for all. Let's dig up the jack screws. Oh, perfect. A device called a jack screw is an integral part of the flap system. As it turns, it moves a nut that extends or retracts the flaps. It's the conclusive proof they need. The flaps were not extended before takeoff. But the finding leaves them with another puzzling question. So why did the pilots think they were extended? Let's go back to the start of the takeoff checklist. The team returns to the cockpit recording, hoping to hear something that might explain the discrepancy. Shoulder harness. They're on. Flaps. 15, 15, green light. Set controls. Tops and bombs are checked. Air instruments, they're set. Takeoff briefing is complete. There was less than one second between the flaps call and his response. There's no way he had time to check and see if the flaps were actually out. Investigators are convinced, despite his response, the first officer could not have extended or even checked the flaps in the time available. The mystery of the flaps is finally solved. A rushed checklist led the Delta pilots to think that their plane was ready for takeoff when it was anything but. There's still one critical question. The alarm would have saved them. Why didn't it sound? Days after the crash of flight MH17 in eastern Ukraine, Dutch investigators are nowhere to be seen. Without access to the wreckage, they risk losing crucial evidence. Despite the setback, the Dutch team refuses to let any speculation about the crash affect their investigation. Best bet, it was shot down. Proving it without any uh, wreckage is nearly impossible. They may be able to disprove other theories being floated in the media. Speculation that flight MH17 may have encountered severe weather, or a technical malfunction, or some other rare calamity. Okay, let's start eliminating other possibilities and um, we'll see what we're left with. We started from, from square one and we looked to all the possibilities one by one in a very structural uh, manner. Okay, let's zoom into the crash area. Okay, this is MH17's intended flight path. Now this is the weather at the time of the crash. Well, what about lightning? Let's check the ATC reports. Oh, look here. This is their intended path right into the storm. But they requested a deviation. The crew circumnavigated the thunderstorm, which is a normal uh, operational action. They bypassed the storm. It wasn't lightning. Taking the maintenance records. These are some of the cleanest occurrence reports I've seen. The technical log's the same. This was a well-maintained airplane. We didn't find any worthiness or maintenance factors that could have factored in the investigation. They even look into the remote possibility that MH17 was hit by a meteor. If it was brought down by a meteor, this is how we'll know. Ultra noise from the day of the crash. Ultra noise is a distinct sound wave that can be measured when a meteor decelerates as it enters the Earth's upper atmosphere. It could happen once every 60,000 years. It is possible, except not this time. There was no meteor activity that day at all. Three possible causes. No likely explanations for what brought down MH17. 
those were all excluded because of the evidence we found. It did not match the expected evidence uh, you would see with these kind of uh, uh, possible causes. Investigators will need to see the wreckage. But so far, they still haven't been able to gain access to the crash sites. In Jakarta, the search for answers to what brought down a Sukhoi demonstration flight takes investigators to air traffic control. So, can you tell me what happened? Well, they were just supposed to do a 30-minute loop. Then before I knew it, they had disappeared from radar. So what did they end up at Mount Selak? I don't know. But weren't you supposed to be monitoring them? I was so busy, I lost track of the plane. Investigators learned that the controller had an exceptionally heavy workload. He was monitoring about a dozen flights. EY7136, cleared to land. JT792, continue approach to runway 24. Making matters worse, both his assistant and his supervisor were absent that shift. He was doing three jobs. Why did you clear them to fly at 6,000 feet? You must have known they would never clear the mountain. My system said it was a military jet. Investigators discover that the airport status system had incorrectly labeled the plane as SU-30, which identifies it as a Sukhoi military aircraft military can fly pretty much as low as they want. Jakarta Control, Sukhoi 36801, requesting descent at 6,000. When the pilots requested a descent, the controller assumed they were heading for a military training area in Bogor, right along the Sukhoi's flight path. Sukhoi 36801, clear to 6,000 feet. EY7136, clear to land. JT792, continue approach to runway 24. The ATC thought that it was a military aircraft flying in a military airspace, so 6,000 is not a concern for them. But I still don't understand why was the plane so far off course? That's a good question. I really don't know. I want to know more about how this tall system works. The investigative spotlight now shines on one of the Sukhoi Superjet's most important safety systems. It's called TAWS, Terrain Awareness and Warning System. Using GPS, it tracks the plane's heading and predicts when it's at risk of colliding with terrain. It's designed to alert pilots in plenty of time to respond. Maybe the system somehow failed. While investigators wait for the cockpit voice recorder, they start with a flight data recorder, which was recovered 21 days after the crash. This is the original flight path here. And we know from the controllers that they requested permission to do an extra 360 degree turn. But the question is, how did they end up here? The flight path data shows the plane's exact route. As he's going southwest, He's on a heading of 240 degrees. It also shows all compass headings entered by the pilots. As he starts to loop down, he changes to 333 degrees. At first, everything seems to be going according to plan. But then, investigators discover something they can't explain. The last input was 174 heading south, over here, right here. He should have put in another input heading back to the north. A compass heading of 174 degrees took the plane south into the mountain. The pilot needed to input another heading of 333 degrees to turn the plane back towards Halim Airport. Investigators wonder if the navigation system somehow failed, leading the pilots off course. Flight systems look fine. Next, they look at how the terrain warning system performed. Did it alert the pilots to impending danger? There's TOS warnings. The data shows that TOS sent out multiple alerts in the final 40 seconds of flight. I don't get it. If the warnings work, then these guys would have known what to do. Investigators are stumped. 
Flight data shows the captain made no attempt to turn the plane. Even more baffling, the TAW system was deactivated 28 seconds before the crash. Why that happened is a complete mystery. Qantas Airways Flight 72 cruises above the Indian Ocean headed for Western Australia. Flight 72 departed from Singapore. The flight path covers almost 2,500 miles across the southern Indian Ocean to Perth, Australia. All right, Ross, out of my way. Captain's back in action. Captain Kevin Sullivan is a former Top Gun fighter pilot with the U.S. Navy. Ross Hales is the second officer. First Officer Peter Lipsat is the next pilot scheduled to go on break. So, Peter, what's the update? We're 100 nautical miles from the coast. Learmonth is to our left. And still cruising at 37,000 feet. All right. Have a good rest. Perfect weather is making for a comfortable flight. We're over the ocean, and things are very smooth. Any changes? Altitude and airspeed's the same. Smooth sailing. Now don't tell me I just jinxed us. The captain notices his autopilot is no longer engaged. Autopilot one disconnects, and now I'm hand flying. It's a bit annoying, but we have two systems. Engaging autopilot two. I engaged autopilot two. And no sooner had I done that, than we started getting overspeed and stall warnings. Stall. Oh. Ecam's showing a lot of errors. Stall. Oh. Overspeed warning. Stall. Oh. How can we be in a stall and overspeed at the same time? Oh. We can't. Airspeed's unreliable. Disconnecting autopilot. That's the first phase of unreliable speed memory checklist. Autopilot off. I'm hand flying now, manually flying. Flight attendant Fuzzy Mayava finally has a moment to grab a bite to eat. And so I focused probably on the timer. 13 seconds. 13 seconds was the actual time. All I could see was the floor disappearing, like away from my feet. We were going up. Sudden G-forces pull passengers up from their seats. Anyone not strapped in hits the cabin ceiling. And next minute, bang. I must have hit the ceiling because it knocked me out. And I'm not sure how long it was for uh, maybe two, three seconds, ten. I, I, I just wasn't sure. The G-force was enough, even with our three-point harness, to lift us both out of the seat and push us forward as well. That's quite disorienting. Flight 72 is suddenly in a dangerous nosedive. Captain Sullivan grabs the side stick to try to level his plane. It doesn't respond. Once I pulled back on the stick and nothing happened, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not in control of this plane. Investigators from the Australian Transport Safety Bureau arrive in Learmonth. In the cabin, there was quite a lot of damage, mainly to the ceiling panels and the ceiling fixtures. Investigators hope data from the plane's quick access recorder can shed light on what went wrong. They focus on the fly-by-wire control system. I'm seeing two abrupt changes in the elevator's position at cruise. Looks like that's what caused the pitch downs. Were those commands coming from the pilots? Oh, they weren't. Weird. Navire one fault. That's not right. 
It seems the plane's fly-by-wire system was sending rogue commands to the flight control surfaces. What the hell is going on? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey. Investigators need to hear the pilot's story. We went through everything that they recalled and any anything unusual in the, in the period beforehand. Describe the flight leading up to the pitch downs. Anything that could have caused these erratic movements. They had a, a pretty good recollection, but had no explanations as to why this happened. And you were getting a lot of faults. Oh yeah, there were a few. Have a look for yourself. It's like the plane had a mind of its own. The A330's post-flight report logs all the cautions and warnings that were affecting the plane. They studied the list, looking for anything that might connect the various warnings. The first question you have is, what's the common element between all these? All these errors are connected to Adaru 1. The Adaru, or Air Data Inertial Reference Unit, relays important information to the flight computers about the environment outside the plane. That Adaru obviously became an important part of the puzzle because it was associated with so many faults. Look at this. I've never seen anything like it. They spot something highly unusual. These are wild angle of attack fluctuations coming from AOA-1. Angle of attack, or AOA, is the angle of the plane's wing relative to airflow. The higher the angle, the less smooth the airflow over the wing. And if the aircraft uh, angle of attack gets too high, then the aircraft can stall. So it's a very important parameter. From over 50 degrees nose up, back to level, then negative 50 degrees. That's not what the pilots described at all. The crew testified that the plane pitched nose down twice. They never said it pitched up. What do the elevator readings say? 10 degrees nose down. He checks other FDR readings that record the plane's pitch. That data also confirms what the crew reported. Show me the angle of attack again. From the flight data recorder information, we could see that the elevators moved in a nose down direction, about 10 degrees. There was an abrupt rate of change. The plane did not pitch up. There's no way this AOA data is correct. What would faulty data like this do to an A330? I'm not sure, but I bet it's not good. Let's go ask Airbus. Joining the investigation is Bob Benson of the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board. Because the aircraft was manufactured in the United States, our role is really to assist the Swiss government um, in determining what happened. It looked to us like the aircraft had, had struck the trees in, in a bit of a level attitude, uh, although parts of the right wing had, had been sheared off by the trees, and that caused a uh, more lift to occur on the on the left side of the aircraft, causing the aircraft to roll. So the eventual impact was nearly inverted. So they were cleared for runway 14. Looks like they're on the right heading. But they're way too low. It's like they don't even know the hill's there. Investigators begin with the flight data, looking for any sign of a mechanical problem on board. Thrust is good. Pitch and roll, fine. Flaps, good. Yep. No stabilization problems. Everything seems normal from a mechanical standpoint. Even the glide is smooth and straight. It's just all over a thousand feet too low. Okay. Can we do a radio approach? Yes. We're at just over 4,000 feet right. here, which is well below the glide slope. Okay, so, but they need to level off to capture the glide, but they kept ascending. On one. Let's do it on one. Radio one confirmed. ILS transmitters send radio signals to two navigational receivers in the cockpit, NAV radio one and NAV radio two. 
the pilots can use either one to guide the plane. Investigators now know the crew selected NAV Radio 1, but they're still hoping to discover something about the unusually low glide slope and about the GPWS. Alitalia 404, reduced to 160 knots. Reducing 160. That's your glide path. So we're on the beam. Did you stop it there? On the beam? You're well below the glide slope there. They are more than 1,000 feet below it. So why is the captain saying then that he captured it? What they're hearing from the cockpit only deepens the mystery. Did they misread the altimeter and the glide slope? I mean, that doesn't seem possible. Let's keep listening for the GPWS. OK. Flaps 25. Flaps 25. The outer marker check is at 1,250 feet, almost four miles. Didn't we pass it? Didn't we pass the outer marker? No. No, it hasn't changed yet. Something in that cockpit is confusing these pilots. Alitalia 404, speed as convenient. Contact tower 118.1. 118.1, goodbye. That doesn't make sense to me. Go around. No, no, no. Hold the glide. The CVR had the first officer attempting to go around and then being countermanded by the captain. There was a lot of confusion there. Can you hold it? Yes, sir. Investigators are stunned, both by what they've heard and by what they haven't heard. No ground proximity warnings at all. And the captain called off a go-around. They now face more questions than ever. The crew of Alitalia Flight 404 is nearing the end of an evening flight to Zurich, Switzerland. Alitalia 404, flight heading 325 radar vectors to ILS 14. Radar vectors to runway 14 on heading 325. Captain Raffaele Liberti is a senior Alitalia pilot with more than 20 years' experience. How much is the visibility? Visibility is nine kilometers. First Officer Massimo De Fraia is the pilot flying the plane tonight. He's new to the airline, having joined just last year. The plane is a McDonnell Douglas DC-9 that's been flying since 1974. The DC-9 was one of the mainstays of the industry in the, from the 1960s through the 2000s. It was very, very popular in the US, Western Europe, and around the world. Flight 404 left Milan's Lanate Airport 25 minutes ago. The flight path takes it almost directly north over the Alps to Zurich's Kloten Airport. At Zurich Air Traffic Control, it's a busy evening. Swiss 3611, maintain 230. Alitalia 404 is lining up for its approach to the airport. The pilots are preparing for what's called an ILS, or Instrument Landing System approach. The instrument Landing System is a series of technologies, primarily radio transmitters on the ground, that allows an aircraft to align itself both vertically and horizontally with the runway. Alitalia 404, reduced to 180 knots. Reducing 180404. Do you have the glide slope? Uh, it's on one. Let's do it on one. The crew sets the navigation instruments to pick up the ILS signal from the runway. Radio unconfirmed. There is a set of signals which goes out at an angle from the ground that gives them an idea of the glide slope. Captured loc, captured glide path, so we're on the beam. Flight 404 is third in line on approach with the runway 12 miles straight ahead. The pilots can't see it yet, but their navigation instruments show they are locked on to the proper signals. All they need to do now to finalize the approach is intercept a radio beacon known as the outer marker. 
The outer marker check is at 1,250 feet, almost four miles. Didn't we pass it? Didn't we pass the outer marker? No, no, it hasn't changed yet. I'll Italia 404, speed as convenient. Contact tower 118.1. 118.1, goodbye. That doesn't make sense to me. The runway should be just ahead, but the first officer still can't see it. Something's not right. Go around. No, 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 no. Hold the glide. Can you hold it? Yes, sir. The next morning, investigators from Japan's Aircraft Accident Investigation Commission survey the devastation. The Airbus is completely destroyed, shattered into thousands of scorched pieces. They have no idea why, and everyone wants answers. Make sure you get shots of everything. Investigators hope the debris field can help them piece together what happened. Nagakatsu Kawahata is working with the Aircraft Accident Investigation Commission. The scattered parts give us hints about the accident. For example, if metal parts were worn out and had disintegrated in the air, we would see evidence of that. They didn't miss by much. Approximately 360 feet east from the runway. The plane crashed just to the side of the airport's one runway. Why would a sophisticated aircraft with an experienced captain end up here? Impact scars. The soft earth by the runway offers clues. Investigators find a series of scars where the plane hit the ground. This one's much deeper. Looks like left side landing gear. The evidence paints a picture of how the plane came down. At a four degree nose up angle and leaning to the left. The landing gear hit first, then the left and right engines. The wings were ripped from the fuselage, rupturing the fuel tanks. The question now is why was the plane coming in at such a sharp angle? Mind if I record our conversation? Go right ahead. Investigators hope the air traffic controller has some answers. Any idea why the plane missed the runway? None. They got a bit close to another plane on approach, but I slowed them down. Reducing 180 knots. A few minutes later, I cleared them to land, and they copied that. Cleared to land runway 34. And I heard nothing until they said they were going around. How'd the pilot sound when he radioed for the go-around? A little rushed, but not panicked. And he didn't say why? No. A go-around isn't considered an emergency situation. The Goya Tower Dynasty going around. It's used to avoid one. Go-around mode is a series of commands sent from the flight management system. It'll apply the climb thrust required to bring it up to a safe altitude after an approach has been aborted. Roger, stand by for further instructions. The controller acknowledged the go-around procedure, but just moments later, the Airbus hit the ground. didn't hear from them again. It was all so fast. The interview only deepens the mystery. Thank you. I'll let you know if I have any other questions. Right. Investigators still don't know why the crew called for a go around or why it went so wrong. Japanese investigators call on Airbus for help. Thanks for coming.
The French manufacturer sends a technical expert who knows the A300 inside and out. I've been examining these instruments, but I'd like to get your take. Confident that the plane's engines and wing flaps were not factors in the crash, investigators turn their attention to the cockpit instruments. In any action investigation, you want to document the cockpit, document the position of switches, any indicators that might show what the position was at impact. They focus on the thrust levers. They're going to tower down to steep going around. Were the thrust levers in the right position to provide enough power for a go around? Forward position, right where we want it. To investigators, it looks like they were. And it matches what the controller told them about Flight 140 requesting a go around. Roger, stand by for further instructions. So the flight computer would have kicked in for the go around mode. Mm -hmm. What investigators have uncovered so far is puzzling. It appears the plane was properly configured to perform a flawless go around. The flaps and slaps were set, the engines were at full power, everything was where it needed to be. So what went wrong? To understand the fatal crash of Flight 140, investigators first need to figure out why the Air China pilots aborted their landing just moments from the runway. Are we ready? They now have an important tool to help them. In 1994, the digital flight data recorder is relatively new. The data should reveal if there was an onboard system malfunction or any alarm warning that landing would be unsafe. This is the timeline of the airspeed. Investigators can see that the speed drops on the initial approach when the Air China crew is dealing with wake turbulence. Better reduce the speed a little more, reduce it to 170. But the speed only drops slightly. Speed is still good for an approach, nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Clear to land, run. The turbulence didn't prompt the pilots to go around. The buffeting stopped in plenty of time for a safe landing. As Flight 140 descends towards 1,000 feet, everything looks normal. They activate the go-around mode right here. I don't get it. Why would they do that? Everything seems fine. The black box data leads investigators to turn a spotlight on the pilots themselves. What were these guys thinking? Digging into their personnel files, they learned that the first officer joined China Airlines as a student, training on small aircraft before working up to the A300. He made first officer just a year before the crash. The China Airlines practice is for new pilots to keep learning on the job with an experienced captain at their side. Captain Wang Lo Chi, 42 years old. Captain Wang should have been up to the task. He had more than 8,000 flight hours over a 24-year career. But when investigators drilled down, it's not so clear-cut. Not a lot of time in the Airbus. They learned that the captain flew Boeing 747s for most of his time at China Airlines and just as a first officer. He was only promoted to captain a year ago when he started flying the A300. He was as new to the plane as his first officer, with just over 1,300 flight hours. So you have a captain that's come from an older generation of airplanes, and you have a first officer that's come from a newer generation of airplanes, but only from a school background. So that's two relatively new pilots on the same airplane. By 1994, there were hundreds of A300s in the skies. Airlines needed trained pilots to fly these technologically advanced aircraft. The crew on the accident flight was part of this surge. It's okay, just do it slowly. Did the pilots understand the flight systems well enough? Only the voice recorder can provide answers. 